Hello and welcome everyone to the Media Education Lab. We are today inaugurating our series on inequalities in media education. And I'm very, very excited to have Dr. Andrea Negrado and Dr. Isabella Rega uh, for our very, very first webinar in this series. Uh, they are absolutely amazing, brilliant scholars. And they're going to be discussing uh, their book. I'm going to be adding all the links to chat so you can check it out, all the information. Um, today, they're going to be talking about uh, their book, Media Activism, Archivism, and the Fight Against Marginalization in the Global South. Um, and they speak about some brilliant concepts where they want to establish dialogues with spaces for young people and mobilize memories and histories. And for this particular session, celebrate the people behind the movements and take forward their activism and art uh, with the focus point of South to South, Global South uh, communication and sustainability. Um, our first speaker and co-editor of the book is Dr. Antia Madrado. Um, she is a senior lecturer at the School of Media and Communication at the University of Westminster. Uh, and she collaborated with our uh, second speaker and co-editor of the book, uh, co-author of the book, Dr. Isabella Rega. Uh, she is an associate professor in digital media for social change at Barnard University. She's also the co-chair of the working group on digital participation in East Asian Network for Education and Emergencies. Uh, they both uh, got this amazing grant by AHRC uh, called E Voices Redressing Marginality, and this book was born out of that project. And they are both now doing a couple of um, other very cool projects, uh, which I hope towards the end of this session we might be able to just hear about. Um, over to you, uh, Drs. Mitrado and Rega. Thank you so much, Davina, for having us here. We're really happy to be here. And thank you to the Media Education Lab. Can everyone hear me? Just checking, see me. Yes, cool. Um, so I'm Andrea Madrado. Isa, maybe you should say hello. <laughs> hello. Nice to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation, Davina. Okay, and that's Isabella Rega. We are talking, we are going to present uh, together on Artivism and the Fight Against Marginalization in the Global South, um, which is based on our book, which is just being published in May by Routledge, and also a project called Deep Voices, which was looking at different uses of digital media by marginalized communities in the Global South. Uh, a project in which uh, Isabella was uh, the principal investigator and I was the co-investigator. At the time, I was based at the Federal Fluminense University in Rio in Brazil, but I moved in 2020 to the UK. Um, so I kind of start, we started writing this book when I was still in Brazil and finished, you know, with me now being based in London at the University of Westminster. So Isabella, can you change to the next slide, please? Okay, so sorry, bear with us, a quick book plug here. This is the book. Um, so the, the idea, as Davina was saying in the beginning, was to explore this idea of South to South, as in Global South communication, because often in the field of activism, media activism, digital activism, we have case studies localized in certain places, uh, but we wanted to focus on the kind of exchanges and mutual learning between different Souths, plural Souths, uh, in how they are facilitated, made possible via different uses of media activism. So um, we have, you know, chapter one is about proposing a, ways of understanding the concept of marginalization, the concept of global South, the concept of media activism from a global South or South to South perspective. Then on chapter two, we focus specifically, oh yeah, I forgot to say something important. So the, in the project, we worked uh, with different global South co countries, contexts, but for the book, we actually focused uh, on Latin America and Africa and specifically the exchanges between Brazil and Kenya. So this is the perspective, you know, from which uh, we are tackling this issue of South to South. 
So the chapter two is really a chapter in which we delve into Brazil and the experiences that we worked with there. Before I worked on the global uh, on the Voices project, I had been researching community media and media activism uh, and media in the favelas and empowerment and um, community education projects in favelas in Brazil for quite some time. Um, Isabella has also has experience uh, in the field of uh, ICTD, information communication uh, for development. Uh, okay, so in chapter three, we actually delved into Kenya, the experiences in Kenya, specifically about artivism. So the combination of art and activism, sorry, and activism. Chapter four um, was about the issue of visibility because it's an issue that kind of became recurrent in our research. As we talked to the groups, they would tell us about how visibility was the starting point for anything to thrive with activism and how groups really are looking for that visibility that can make their voices echo and make their work resonate. But then once they do achieve that visibility, this comes with vulnerability as you know, so many implications um, that we have now with algorithms, uh, with, with, well, you know, with deep fakes. So anyway, we actually delved into this issue of how visibility sometimes turns into vulnerability and the exchanges that the groups could have with each other, lessons learned about this issue. Then chapter five is more really about artivism and animation as a language to make this artivism possible. So two animated films were made one was made in Kenya. I will tell you about that in a moment, but it was made in Kenya about Mariel Franco. Mariel Franco was a politician, a city councillor, a black woman, someone who was born and raised in a favela, also a lesbian, and the only self-declared black woman at the time of her killing. She was killed um, in 2018 together with her driver. The murder is still unsolved. And her struggles, you know, what she fought for represents the struggles of so many activists uh, in the global south that we thought her story could be a kind of a connective thread. So the artivists in Kenya made this, this piece, you know, of animated film to honor her. And then later that year, the filmmaker made a film about Wangadi Matai, also a Kenyan politician, a woman, a political, you know, powerful uh, woman, also, you know, an activist, environmental activist, Nobel Prize winner. So the experience actually was of the Brazilians making a film to honor her. This was actually not part of the uh, e Voices project. It was funded by the uh, Goethe Institute. But in any case, it shows this kind of artivist and artistic exchanges between the two countries. And finally, in the sixth chapter, we have, you know, a reflection about our journey. And there are three things, actually, I wanted to say about this journey of producing this book and working on this project. The first one is that I think for both me and Isabella, it was kind of a way for us to find our own voice as authors, as writers. I can totally see that journey, you know, as we evolved from chapter one to two to three. And that journey, um, at some point, also, as we are reflecting on issues of visibility, involved visibilizing our own lives, personal lives as well. Like we're both mothers, Isabella and I connected. We have children, same age. So, you know, sometimes this issue of being a mother, an academic, sometimes in quite precarious work conditions, juggling, teaching, working, admin, all so many things are often so hidden in the process, you know, of writing books and publishing and producing academic outputs and etc. So we thought we're writing about visibility. Let's visibilize this as, as well. So our stories also kind of come through a bit, you know, over, hopefully not an overly, uh, I don't know, uh, not in a narcissistic way or anything like that, but because we thought this was important for our voices to come through. And finally, this was also a journey searching for, you know, searching for ditching a bit of the same canons, you know, when we, as me, for example, someone from the global south, born in Brazil, raised in Brazil, now working in the global north. And we find ourselves often, you know, citing the same authors, the same references and so Eurocentric and global north centric. So it was also a journey of us, you know, searching, for example, for African scholars and putting them in dialogue with Latin American scholars and finding lots of commonalities and, and common threads. So. One thing that we wanted to actually propose to you here, if you think this is a good idea, is um, as we are having the session now, if we could all exchange perhaps in the chat 
um, sources from the global south or in the global south and i know this is quite complicated because what counts really as global south someone like me for example who i am now working in the global north so obviously very influenced uh, by the environment that i'm working in at now do we count as global south scholars but in any case we would be really curious to hear and to share you know with you these resources if you could and perhaps we could compile some kind of collective thinking or collective list about uh, authors from the Global South working, you know, uh, with these issues uh, that could be helpful references when we when we think about this issue of Global South, South to South dialogues. Um, also, yes, we also had the issue now recently uh, with Boaventura Souza Santos, um, which I know is a quite um, complex topic to, I don't want to delve into this here, but we were thinking, you know, this person was so key for our referencing of Global South and what it means and are we going to keep citing, you know, given everything that's happened? So we can, that's why also we thought it would be a useful exercise to sort of exchange ideas on sources and references, uh, writing about issues of South to South and Global South dialogues. Okay, next slide. Have you changed it, Isa? And I not seen. Oh, you have. I can't see it. I'm still seeing the same slide. Sorry about that. Nope. Okay. Sorry. I don't know. I stopped Sorry about that. Start... Sorry. Let me start sharing again and see if it works. No worries. Hopefully, it is for every slide. Can you see? Yes. Okay, so that's the idea of the book, to capture these moments when these narratives in different Souths, uh, plural Souths, intertwine, trans transform each other and reach each other. Why are we working with Brazil and Kenya specifically? Of course, there were practical reasons in terms of the partners that we had, you know, for the project, but also both Brazil and Kenya are countries that have media representations which are often very binary. Um, and criminalize sometimes, you know, poverty. So, for example, these binary representations on the media about shanty towns or slum residents or favela residents, you know, either as, you know, the good citizen or the criminal person, the shanty town versus the city as if it was like a separate city. Um, and all this kind of really binary and uh, unhelpful media representations um, end up criminalizing uh, poverty, normalizing, or even justifying, you know, daily killings, for example, in poor communities. This was a, an issue uh, in underprivileged communities. This was an issue that was recurrent in both countries. And also both countries are very active um, activists uh, on social media, on Twitter in Kenya and Brazil, you know, very social media active. So those are some of the reasons. We also were thinking of this idea of using different languages and artistic uh, languages and tools to challenge colonial hierarchies that really devalue, you know, the, the knowledges that stem from the global south. So what I was saying earlier of really trying to reveal, you know, all this knowledge, this wisdom that stems from the, from the global south, the stories that we don't hear that are erased. Um, I mentioned, you know, the idea of the two animation workshops that, you know, one about Marielle Franco, Brazilian, powerful Afro uh, feminist figure made in Kenya, and then in Brazil, an animation made about Wangari Matai. And how can these practices uh, can be used as a tool for solidarity? And I know solidarity, like empathy, you know, all these are contested words, decoloniality, they've been appropriated. Um, and it's also another quite complex topic, but that's what we were interested, you know, this idea of fostering solidarity by the South to South artivist, artistic and ac activist exchanges and using intersectional and decolonial uh, epistemological theoretical perspectives to understand media activism and artivism from a kind of South to South perspective. Also thinking about the importance of mobilizing memories, mobilizing the histories, as I said, that have not been told. Next. No. Oh God. <laughs> Sorry. Should I maybe do it? 
don't know what's happening. We also had our like technical rehearsal before starting. Sorry about this. We try. Really? If it keeps happening like this, then I try to share from my own. Can you see slide changing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll be quick about this. So of course, the Global South is again a contested um, concept. I read recently something, you know, oh, the Global South is over. We don't want to use that term anymore. Um, but uh, as we know, it's not only about geography, it goes way beyond geography um, to speak of issues of inequality, oppression, marginalization. And we find it, you know, it would, would be interested to interesting to hear what you think about this as well. We find it both, of course, problematic and useful. Problematic in a sense that it really lumps together all the others, you know, all the rest of the world. Kind of when we arrive in London, that there's that little sign, rest of the world, you know, go there, queue for hours. Um, so it lumps it all together. And obviously that kind of homogenizes and, um, the South, which is very, of course, plural, nuanced. There are now so Souths in the North and Norths in the South as well. But at the same time, we find it useful, strategic for this connection purpose. It's like a political solidarity project in a way. And most importantly, it's like a conversation started. And I, we are finding this really, really powerful, you know. And uh, I'd say also applies, like, for example, exchanges I've been having with colleagues from India, from all other so-called global Souths, in which we start these conversations, for example, about colonial pain, scarring, and healing, you know, the possibilities of healing these colonial scars. So that's how we are um, thinking of the global South. Next. Could you see the next? Now, now, yes, yes, good. <laughs> now it's your turn. Okay, cool. Um, yes, and um, for, for like the next part of this talk, what we want to do is to share a little bit more insights about how the animation we Andrea was talking about was created and what are the the consequences and the legacy and the the impact that this animation uh, had in terms of uh, this dialogue between different communities and different activists um, into in the two countries in the global south because of this um, venue what we wanted to add here is also a lens um, like thinking about the activities that we have done and there is and the um, uh, output of, of the e Voices project from a media literacy perspective. And this is also uh, one of the, as Divina was asking, one of the hopefully next uh, endeavor that um, Andrea and I wants to work uh, in, like combining uh, the work with, that we have done with uh, eVoices with media literacy and political literacies uh, in different countries in, in the global south. So um, if we, if we uh, have a, um, a media literacy lens, um, we could think that the, the project and the animation workshop we developed during the eVoices projects um, um, contribute to media literacy in two, in two, in two ways. Um, first of all, um, in terms of capabilities. So um, capabilities happen when people uh, use their media literacy, so the access to media and information, the awareness of sources and representation and trust, trust, trustworthy content in a more active ways uh, for particular purposes in their life, ra rather than being just passive consumers. Um, but we divided capabilities uh, from consequences because we uh, don't want to have a positivistic um, uh, and technocentric look at media literacy because you could have, you can have more capabilities and actually causing more harm. So capabilities and more capabilities in media literacy can uh, mean uh, more civic en engagement through digital media and technology, but it also like this capability can be used also uh, for making like for producing more harm. And we have a lot of examples in the last years, and I, I like I don't have to to talk about them uh, here. 
Um, and so therefore we wanted to also reflect about consequences. It's a nuance and subtle differences, but when we talk about consequences, it's, all, it's really focusing on how um, media literacy can be used to support positive change uh, in the life of people, in the communities, and the, in the society and media ecosystem uh, at large. So how uh, people can use those literacy uh, in a more, more make, to make a constructive and positive impact. Um, so with also this, can I change slide? Can you see the next slide? So with this in mind, in the uh, eVoices project and in chapter five weeks uh, of our book, we explain this. Um, um, we, we run an um, animation workshop um, uh, like to work on, on capabilities in terms of media literacy and uh, about uh, like gathering young artists and activists in Kenya to produce in less than one week an animation about Marielle Franco. Uh, and Andrea explained why, uh, who was Marielle Franco. And uh, that was in 2018. And uh, she had just been murdered a few months ago. And that was something that really shaped uh, the media activist communities in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, together we, Ngendo Muki and uh, Paola Callus, two other colleagues, and uh, artist di director in, in the project, we um, uh, thought that she could be like, uh, um, like one character, one, one of the fi figures, like how um, Devina said at the beginning of, it, of this webinar, that could uh, nurture this connection. Um, and why we decided to use animation? Because animation uh, affords a range of different aesthetic device to be used, and uh, it can use a range of physical materials that can be combined into a series of images that then create the moving image. And uh, so artists uh, and activists uh, with no previous knowledge of animation, but have practice uh, with other media, can deploy their artistic skills, can use their artistic skills and combine them uh, in in a very short time, as I said, in less than one week, to create an animation. And then also because uh, in the way in which Paula and Ngendo um, thought about and conceived the workshop, uh, animation uh, encouraged collaboration and collab collaborative practice. Um, because to make a consistent piece and coherent piece, piece uh, artists have to dive, artists while intervening on the still image have to dialogue to make it uh, yes one one final video one final piece. Um, so to achieve a single goal, the practice has to be collective and collaborative. It cannot be uh, a solo endeavor. Um, so how we operated. Um, so we collected hundreds of images of Marielle, uh, um, like from videos uh, from the net, the internet, when she was campaigning, images of, images of the protests that erupted in Brazil when she was killed. And then we printed them in letter size. You can see this in, um, in, the, in the picture here. Um, and we asked artists to, man to intervene manually uh, on them with drawing, coll collages, collages, whatever they wanted to do. Um, and while doing that, we were, uh, ask we were asking them to reflect on how, how they were affecting, uh, how would they, they were uh, intervening on the image, uh, uh, what, 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 what was the meaning of it. So, what's the effect that they were making while intervening on those images. Um, and they started, as I said, like first day working on a couple of images to start seeing how the animation, uh, like the moving from a still image to a moving image would have, would have worked. Um, and then day by day and half a day by half a day, they were starting to be in or more than one frame so they start with two frames and then they start working on five frames and then 10 frames 
And while doing so, they had to communicate with the artists working on their left and the artists working on the right, as I said, to make this a consistent and cohesive piece. Uh, once, um, and they were choosing different media, uh, you know, as I said, to intervene on this image and reflecting or concept of erasing or uh, adding to, to those images. Uh, and at the end, uh, all um, 900, I think, I don't remember the number, Andrea, um, images were uh, put, uh, scanned back and uh, animated. And now I think this is the most important moment of this talk. We would like to share with you the, um, the output of this workshop. <laughs> Nina machon zi mojoni Nina macho zi machoni Wa History ni sad yani But same time ni tamu yani Design na kumbusha ni kukumbusha Kucheki yani Look within you juu Kutapata unachosaka Juu mawiku ilifunga Na sayi juu imechomoza design Nina prove it's a new day Tuko fun na see my eyes are red juu Ya machozi nili Nili mwaka jana but Nina hope So I can still see Nataka ni spell hii jina Na si jina tu Ni hii jina ikona si katikati Yani F-R-A-N-C-O But most importantly M-A-R-I-E-L-E Yani Nabonga kusu Franco Mariel Marielle, Marielle Tulipoteza Tulipoteza Marielle Lakipiga niya haki Saki na mama mawalala hoi Wanyonge na walionyongwa na serikali Kweli hii serikali Nina serikali za kuiba maisha za watu Wa Hii serikali Nina serikali Za kuiba maisha za watu Long live in our hearts. R.I.P. F. Maria. R.I.P. Wana siya santi tezi wahaki. Yakina dada na badom zazi aliku wakawa kili wa watu maskini wanaoteso na serikali katili. Wana tumia vikosi vya polisi kusimamishi ya watu maisha kwa risasi. I forgot to mention that also the soundtrack of the animation was made in these four days. Uh, so the music was created based on a song, beloved song from Marielle, inspired by a beloved song from Marielle, and then uh, the, the, the words are in Changi, um, like a urban um, dialect combining Swahili um, and English and um, yeah, so like the soundtrack, the music, the words were all created in, in these four in these four days. So um like working in these ways, participants were able to leave their own marking in the original uh, image uh, with the materials and processes that they chose. And this enabled them to relate to the message to Marielle Franco's stories and uh, to the experience of the Brazilian activists in many different ways. Um, so, like people could start from their, could draw from their standpoints to intervene upon those images, transforming them into something meaningful. One example is the one of the sunflower that um, one of the artists uh, mentioned was for her like a symbol uh, or a way for her to reflect about her experience as a single mother in Kibera, uh, the biggest uh, slum in Nairobi, and how single mother has to be uh, resilient and chase lights in any shanty town around the world, Brazil, Kenya, or anywhere else. And so how this connect their experience with experience of uh, the other art activists and artivists uh, in this case, uh, in in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro. Um, so this creative process enabled Kenyan artists to connect to Brazilians and vice versa, if we had the time to show the other animation. 
and to initiate a dialogue that I'll, Andrea will, uh, the seeds of it will, will illustrate in a, in a moment. And we, we, if we go back to think about it in terms of consequences and positive consequences affecting life and societies, uh, in the book we talk about how you know this process um, could enable dialogical spaces and mobilize memories and histories uh, across uh, uh, South to South. Okay, so then we have this idea of the artivism and the animation within the artivism as an enabler of the South to South dialogues. Another interesting issue was when we were talking to the participants of these workshops, both in Brazil and Kenya, when they were making these animations, they were saying, well, actually, the starting point was art. You know, we all came here because we are drawn by art. Art is a driving force. Whether, you know, as Isabella was saying, uh, they were not necessarily, you know, familiar with animation and as an artistic language, but they were all artists. So the art really brought them together. They were talking about how they were sitting literally in a circle and drawing together and the power that this connection of making art together has and how the, the political aspect, you know, you know, it comes as a consequence, is a consequence in a way, but the art is the, is the starting point, you know. We, without the art, we would not learn the histories. One of the participants, Milena in Brazil, who made the animation about Wangari, um, said. Um, so yeah, so we felt very connected, you know, with uh, with these experiences. Next, uh, um, okay. So the other thing is that both in Brazil and Kenya, and uh, Wangari Matai, of course, is a very well known figure. But most of the participants in the Brazilian workshop, they did not know anything about Wangari Matai. So again, this reflection about the Eurocentric histories and figures that we across the South, you know, are exposed to. And, and for these women, you know, especially, they were all like talking about this, how amazing it was to learn about Wangari, who she was, what she represented, these powerful African feminist figures that we never learn about, we never hear about. And also about the filmmaker herself, because the filmmaker was also someone who's quite well known, you know, in the, in the, in the animation uh, industry in Kenya, and they did not know about her. And also they got to know each other. So it's all these issues of learning, you know, these histories, learning from a kind of a pluriversal perspective, um, these living stories. Um, and they talk about ancestry as well. It's something very, very strong, particularly with the Brazilian participants, learning about their ancestors. You know, this uh, workshop that made the film, uh, in which the film about Wangari was produced, was based in Salvador, Bahia, which is the black capital of Brazil. So um, all these issues of, for example, the stories from Africa, um, which are, of course, very homogenized and erased. So this was also another element uh, that they were really emphasizing, uh, how these kind of provided them with references, plural references, pluriversal references that they could draw inspiration from. Next. And also this idea that, you know, honoring black women and their perspectives, their conceptions of human rights. So, for example, from Marielle's perspective, she was a fighter, an advocate for human rights against police brutality, for example, in the Brazilian favelas and the killing of innocent lives, you know, as a result of police operations. With Wangari, her conception, you know, was more around environmental justice. And again, you know, challenging colonial hierarchies that attribute less value to Global South knowledge. So the knowledge that these women were offering about these issues uh, being communicated through an artistic, artivistic, perhaps we can call output uh, that helped uh, unfreeze. They, they talk about the freezing of each other's knowledge because, you know, coloniality makes us think that, you know, uh, indigenous knowledges are frozen in the past. They didn't evolve, you know, they stopped there in the past. There isn't living history, it's not moving. So it's quite interesting because animation is all about movement. So it's all about unfreezing these knowledges from the South. And these knowledges come to life, they breathe, they inspire, they, they move each other. Next. And also this idea of the stories being interconnected, sometimes with us uh, knowing. I remember when we went to Kenya, for example, I went to Kenya with Isabella, and one of my first tasks was to introduce the 
artivists, the artists, uh, to Marielle's story, which I felt was a really big responsibility, especially because me, you know, my own subjectivity, positionality, identity in the UK, uh, I'm, you know, considered a, a Latina, a woman of color, but in the Brazilian context, I'm a white woman. Uh, so talking about this experience of a, of, a, of a black woman in the Kenyan context, but um, as soon as I spoke, you know, about the things she was fighting for, um, the reality, for example, police brutality, the connections between those stories became really, really evident. So the participants were saying, you know, um, yeah, our stories are actually interconnected, you know, whether we realize it or not, um, activities like these, experiences like these help us build a kind of collective memory, a meaningful memory that had been unknown to us. Uh, so we learned these histories, but we also made histories. Um, so if we recognize ourselves uh, in our stories, in our histories, we can become stronger. Also in Kenya, uh, participants were speaking about this idea of a collective loss, you know, a collective uh, grief in a way about what happened to Marielle. So these were very powerful um, experiences, as well, although, of course, we don't want to romanticize here that, you know, it's all about understanding and that there are no, no difficulties or challenges involved in, in, in an experience like that. But um, this issue of the interconnection of the stories was very strong. Next. Okay, so to conclude, and apologies if we talk a little bit long and about the issue of, you know, changing the slides. Um, but this idea of paying homage to these two powerful women, you know, Marielle Franco, Wangari Matai, could teach just the power of connection of stories and the transformations that can happen. Um, an interesting quote as well was another participant that, that, that was saying that um, she kind of felt, you know, in the beginning, she was saying, well, I don't really see myself as an activist. I see myself more as an artist. So the whole idea of the artivist, you know, I, I see myself more on the art, not necessarily the activism. And then as the experience progressed, she was like, well, you know what, something like that is activist. Why not? You know, I am an activist. So it's a kind of a transformation, a transformative journey. Um, and the dialogues, which are defined by this creation of collective memories, um, the way that they could make something, something new, a kind of a collective um, artifact, a collective, speaking to a collective memory, and also learning to unlearn sometimes negative information, negative colonial mental loads that we have about each other across the plural global south. Uh, and um, so, but what, was it like a passing transformative moment or, or is it something sustainable, you know, these relationships? Again, we don't mean to romanticize things. Of course, a project like this is very challenging to begin with. Yes, funding ends and then you start this, great projects and then what do you do next you know without the funding where do you go of course language issues cultural issues um brazilians you know talking directly to kenyans for example there's the issue of translation and, and language but something really interesting that happened is that in a way a lot of these outputs you know the animations they kind of gain a life of its own after the project ended so to give you an example recently we learned um that now there's an exhibition in Museo da Repubblica, big big museum in Rio, about uh, Marielle Franco, and actually the animation is being played, and we didn't know. We found out accidentally, like on social media. So there's it's still ongoing, of course, and it's alive. It's like the animation; it's coming to motion, and uh, it's something that really I think inspires us and motivates us. Um, really, again, going back to this idea of a political solidarity project, a conversation starter. Um, I think that's that's how we would like to think about it. Of, although, of course, there are many, many challenges. But uh, yes, I think that's what we had to share. Oh, one final thing about the book is that if anyone wants to learn about, you know, possibilities of accessing the book, wink, wink, uh, get in touch with us. Unfortunately, the price is a little bit um, prohibitive. Someone actually told me off on Twitter. Oh, wow, you write about marginalization, the global south, and this book so expensive. And I had to explain to this person how things work in academic publishing, and that it's not really, you know, <laughs> up to us. And anyway, that's another very complicated uh, topic. But um, yeah, that's what we had to say. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Davina, again for having us. Thank you so much. So, um, They've, there's already been a lot of chatter in, in the DMs here. 
and I'm going to quickly run through that. So uh, you partially answered uh, Barbara Harrison's question, uh, but if you'd like to also speak about it uh, here in the discussion, um, Barbara was mentioning, does the criminalization that you mentioned in, in your talk um, of poverty originate from past colonization? You addressed that in the comments, but if you could just speak about it a little bit in uh, the discussion right now. No, absolutely. I think it is very interconnected to hierarchical, colonial hierarchies of people who are deemed worthy, unworthy, the bodies that are humanized or dehumanized, for example, the bodies that can be killed, that can die in the name of whatever, war on drugs or... So, yeah, absolutely, colonial colonial legacies and internal colonial legacies and ongoing internalized uh, multiple, um, yes, absolutely. And uh, it, it was very interesting because, again, it was an issue that kept coming up in the different countries that we worked uh, when we're talking about media activists that are, of course, very attentive to the representations on the media of poverty, of the poor or the minorities or the marginalized and how criminalized they are, either that or very simplistic representations that romanticize poverty. Oh, everyone in the community loves each other, support each other. They're poor, but they support each other. Either like that or, you know, they're all criminals, they're all drug dealers. And we don't get to learn these this, this nuanced stories of daily life, of resilience of humanity you know so yeah hope i answered your question yeah sorry i, I want i just wanted to say that i think also in chapter two and three we talk about it because the the um, organization that we work with power 254 and the media activists in in, in kenya and the media activists in brazil actually uh, as you were saying, um, uh, a lot of them started to fight against the, against this, right? To fight against police brutalities and the dehumanization of bodies in Rio de Janeiro, and um, to 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 document uh, police brutality and uh, brutality during election in Kenya. So I think yes, this is a, a very key key point that has been made in the in the chat. Yeah, thank you for your questions, yes. Uh, I have one more question that's part of the question that you just answered. The people, when when the, the colonizers were being pushed out, they also trained the majority ethnic group to sit in power. And as you had said, the internal colonialism, would, um, would you say that the majority of people in poverty are from the minority ethnic groups th that live in that. Okay, you understand my question. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes, that is a very, very good point. Yeah, they internalize dynamics that are then perpetuated, replicated, absolutely. I mean, the vast majority of populations, although the favelas are very uh, complex and uh, they're not homogenous, so it depends on which favela, which area of the city. For example, uh, there are favelas in Rio, the way the city is organized, there are favelas everywhere, including near so-called wealthy yeah. neighborhoods. So to live in a favela like that, of, it's actually quite expensive. Some houses in favelas close to the wealthy areas so then these tend to be actually a bit whiter as well but the but the of course the minorities the the, the black brazilians the migrants from the poor poorer um underprivileged parts of brazil who migrate to bigger cities in the southeast like rio and sao paulo uh, are the vast majorities of people who have the more precarious uh living arrangements um so yes thank you so much um, it's a really good point uh, we have another question from Wade Gardner, who is a social justice filmmaker. Uh, he's also shared a link to a movie called El Dorcer uh, Socio. Um, he's asking, can you speak to also accumulating film sources, etc.? 
accumulating film sources. Um, sorry, in what sense? Wait, and thank you. Oh, I just wanted to say as well that I've been trying to kind of keep up with the chat, but uh, I haven't been able to. So, Devin, I don't know if it would be possible later to sh to compile these uh, all these wonderful links that were shared. Um, and I, uh, sorry, uh, what I meant was when you had given your presentation, if I heard you correctly, uh, you had said something to the effect of accumulating works from authors. Mm. And so that's what prodded the question to bring about the question about in, uh, integrating film. Ah, uh, right, right, right. No, it wasn't. the Well, the way it was done was that these images were uh, that were used in both animations. They were, they were found online. They were like images from the campaign when Maria was campaigning, the film that she made in her political advertisement, um, the protests. But it wasn't like a, a, a collage of multiple authors' work. No. Um, the way it was done was with these images and they were actually printed in pieces of paper, A4 letter size, and then each artist uh, did collage or manually drawings you know, on top of the images. Then they were scanned and they were animated. But of course, you know, the, the issue of multiple authors is a very, very interesting one because now this animation is in a museum together with lots of other works of art from other authors from favelas in Brazil, for example, about Marielle, in Marielle's case. Um, so in a way, I think a, a work like that triggers this, this importance of collectivity, collective voice and collective works together. But I don't know if I answered you. your question. Well, you know, the only thing was my timing. It was about, it was before learning about the animation. So all is good. All right. Okay. I hope it, I it, was a, it was a question asked way at the beginning. <laughs> I hope all I explained good. it correctly and did justice. Oh, also, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and hey, what I wanted to add real fast is that um, from my viewpoint, being a film programmer and working in film as long as I have, I see cycles about certain areas of the country. And so the Global South, starting last year, uh, as an example, I'm a screener for the San Francisco International Film Festival. And so I see, I start, and then for my own work, I see a lot of films and I saw a lot of films this last year that are talking and bringing up this artivism. That was the link I put in. So thanks for your work. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you You're so welcome. much. And mm -hmm. thanks for your question. You're welcome. Uh, please remember to check the chat because a lot of people have posted very interesting sources and links. Um, also, uh, if I could ask Michael Hexman to come uh, off mute and ask your question. Sure, thank you. And thanks uh, to Andrea and Isabella for this uh, great talk. Um, and also just for sharing this you know, exciting research. This is very important research. Um, I, I'm going to ask a question about that theories of change infographic, but I want to make one comment about the South to South um, uh, dialogue, because about 30 years ago, I was trying to, I've been working on this area of Latin American cultural studies and Latin American media studies for a long time. And, and, and I was trying to do some work, you know, which was all using Latin American only authors, right, and theorists. And people like Nestor Garcia Canclini's uh, Hybrid Cultures and Jesus Martin Barrero's Media to Mediations, you know, these were really, really important works and we were translating them and doing stuff with them at the time. But one of the things I remember doing was going into their bibliographies, right, and to see who was informing their work. And and what I was finding was these really richly hybrid, um, you know, schools of thought embedded in those very authors. So that whole South South piece, um, especially at that time, and I'm not saying that it hasn't changed, um, is, is complicated. And and what I'm liking about your project is is the South South research sites, you know, and and I do think that um, we need to uh, you know sort of listen more and to to integrate more of the South uh, authors from the South. But this thick comment I put in the in the side here about the Anglosphere, I was also involved in that whole discussion, and and that that there, there's something deeply corrupt about our academic systems, which are forcing people into publishing in so-called tier one journals, which happen to be written in this one hegemonic language, and and it and it it it, it disempowers so dramatically people who then you know go finding a translator and doing all this work to uh, 
prepare before they even have a chance to submit an article. So, so this conversation, I'm sorry, I'm getting excited, maybe too much coffee here, but it's, it's big, right? It's really big and it, we can't finish it in these minutes, but maybe that's my question. And my comment is like, what, what's your reaction to that? Because the theories of change thing I put into the, the chat, but I, I was curious about um, whether communication technology, the change of communication technology, which I think often is invisibilized in our in 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 the discourse that's social, that like the socio political discourses, people are just like, oh, look at this technology, look what's happening, or oh, look what those people are doing, right? And uh, and we forget that people were doing something similar twenty years ago, or they were doing something very different, and that 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 all that stuff that you know McLuhan helps with that is tetrad, and you know like how what what changed, what was recuperated, you know what was left behind, etc. But um, I think I've just left a, a big ba bag of ideas there. And I, I guess I'll just say thank you again for your talk. And uh, uh, if you have any reactions, that's all great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Absolutely. It is very, very complicated. And also, we don't want to be in a way deterministic. Uh, when we are seeking as well, the so, you know, for example, the canons of the South, yeah, if we can call them... Um, they are inspired by authors in the north and the south. Of course, this is the way things work, right? And we don't want to be deterministic. Oh, this is true south, this is not. Or, but it is true that um, the way that things work and they continue to work, these dynamics are so complicated and it's such a disadvantage for authors from the global south. Yes, absolutely. I mean, just do a quick... And also the metrics that are now being used, you know, increasingly more and more for promotions for everything, citation rankings, have a look very quickly. Uh, your colleagues in departments, for example, who were based in the Global South for a long time, you very quickly will see that their citation are way, way, way lower. Of course, that has to do with language, with publishing in English. Someone like me, I'm incredibly privileged for the, you know, Brazilian, my, my Brazilian colleague, the fact that I am now somewhat comfortable writing in academic English. Um, but, but, but yeah, like uh, everything from the editorial, uh, the editorial boards of journals, from the actual writing and the process of becoming familiar. When I was also commenting on the issue of finding a, a voice when I was writing, because I remember getting comments like, oh, you're so wordy in the way you write. Well, of course, like I am wordy. Um, and then actually becoming comfortable with that, you know, with the way that I write in English. But it's 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 very, very complex, very complicated, but also, you know, potentially problematic as well. Like we use some concepts that we learned or epistemologically, we're trying to think of concepts that we learned in our fieldwork. For example, cria de favela is a term in Portuguese, someone who was brought and raised in a favela. And then I thought, what if I, they start citing me as the person who, coined this term I wasn't you know I learned that from people in the favelas if I do that then I'm doing the same thing that the so-called anglosphere is doing to us anyway <laughs> it gets very complicated but thank you for raising and um yeah the issue I don't know if Isa would like to add something the the theory of change I think that I'll leave it with Isabella <laughs> to talk about you know, like, sorry, I'm a bit, <laughs> a bit lost now, Michael. Um, yeah, so the theory of change was um, developed because we wanted to, well, I think, like, the first thing is this this difference that I made between capabilities and consequences. And, like, because of how digital uh, and, and media literacy projects are, uh, are conceived, we wanted to make this distinction distinction very clear and is made like what is the level of analysis the level of analysis is from the they cannot say at the individual level because it's an ecosystem at the end and um so the idea was like like um uh, push project in projects in the media literature to think about, you know, um, these four uh, elements as interrelated elements and to um, uh, also 
like look at critically about what 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 is the role of capabilities in uh, um, creating more social justice. I don't know if I answered to your question, but, it was, but like I think it's more a comment on your. Um, I can see that we are a little bit over time, and I apologize, but this discussion has been so so enlightening and such fun. And thank you so much, uh, Drs. Medrado and Rega, for speaking with us. And thank you so much, everyone, for participating so actively in the chat, as well as here uh, in, in the discussion. Um, lucky for us, this is the first webinar in our series of Inequalities in Media Education. Uh, the next one happens next month. It's on FemWork and one of speakers is actually here attending the session today. Excuse me, sorry. It's going to be by Professor Usha Raman and Professor Payal Arora. I've just added a link to chat. Uh, please go ahead and click on the link. You'll know more about the webinar that's going to happen next month. Um, I'm also adding the link to their open access book called Feminist Futures of Work in Chat. Um, if you get a chance, please go ahead and read the book or at least the introduction of the book uh, and join us for media, uh, for inequalities and uh, media education seminar next month. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Davina. And thank you, the Media Education Lab. Really enjoyed being here. And do get in touch with us. Yes, let's carry on this conversation. I I try to copy all the links. I might have missed some. So yeah, if this go could be shared, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.